So this is how Microsoft uses C++ to deliver Office, huge size and small components. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. If you're tuning in online, if you're watching later, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Zach Henkel. I'm a developer in Office's core architecture team. Uh, my primary job is to work on the long-term health and sustainability of our native code. Um, in many ways, this is part three of two talks that were given at the very first CppCon back in 2014, where they were talking about how Office uses uh, C++. It's now required that you would have seen those talks. But a couple times throughout my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, where some of the things that I'm touching on actually tie back to things that were discussed in greater detail on those. And I'll have links at the end to, uh, for you to take a look if you'd like to watch it after we're done here. Um, before we jump in, I'm going to get my clicker working. There you go. Um, just want to say welcome from all of the talks that Microsoft is presenting here. Uh, please join in to the Discord channel that is for Visual Studio in the CppCon Discord. We have a survey that we'd love to have you take about your experience with C++ and how Microsoft and our tooling can help you. And then we also have a booth right outside this room uh, we'll be there today and tomorrow, and if there are questions that I don't get to at the end of this talk, I'll plan to be out there if anybody wants to follow up with me right after the talk, or feel free to come find me later on. So what we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Office, and then we'll dive into the two topics that are were right on the uh, title slide, the huge size, and then the small components. Uh, we call those liblets in Office, and we'll talk about kind of what the design and philosophy of those is. Um, and then I have a little preview of some work that I'm just starting to get underway and would like to share how far we've gotten with it so far. If you have questions, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could just note the slide number. Happy to go back and then save them for the end, and I'll, I'll cover all the questions then. So if you looked at the description, uh, Office is nearly 40 years old. The first public release of anything that still ships today in Office was Word for DOS. So it was released in 1983. It was originally written in C. In 1985, Office started its cross-platform journey. Uh, that was the release of Word for the classic Mac OS, not OS X, and that's in a couple years. Um, in 1990, we had the first release of Office as a suite. So uh, marketing came up with the idea we'd take Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Mail, which was a program creatively called Mail, to do email, put them in a box, and sell them together. Sold like gangbusters, and it was the Office suite from then on. Uh, in 1992, Office, or, uh, just PowerPoint in Office took the plunge, and uh, started moving extensively to C++. This wound up being really important because this is well before C++ 98, before the um, standard library kind of became the uh, same high quality release that we had now. I mean, they had the uh, private releases from HP and stuff, but uh, PowerPoint did a lot of the heavy lifting to write the kinds of things that you expect from a library that would be used throughout C++, strings, containers, et cetera. Uh, in 1995, there was a project to take a whole bunch of shared code, and instead of having to duplicate it among them, this is kind of more on the journey of Office becoming a suite more than it is individual applications. Um, we created a shared DLL called MSO, We'll be talking a lot more about MSO throughout the talk. Uh, in 1996, the rest of Office took the plunge and started moving more of it to C++ as the first class language. Uh, in 2001, we had the first release for um, Mac, the modern Mac OS for OS X. This gets covered a lot more in those talks from 2014, if you'd like to hear more about the ways that we added support for Apple's products throughout the history of the code base. 2010, we had released Office for the Web. 
2013, we released uh, iOS and Android versions of the Office applications. Um, the uh, iPad was a separate release uh, very shortly thereafter. And then one of the more recent things that we had done was we added Clang analysis for code that is traditionally shipped on the Windows platform just for the, it's just static analysis and, and tooling. No, no production binaries are made for that. Um, so for the uh, uh, platforms that we support today, uh, some details, Windows, we have what we call the Win32 client. That's the classic experience. It's the versions, if you're running Windows 11, these will be the applications that you know and love and are used to. There's a separate set of applications that you can download from the Windows Store um, for everything that's in Office. Uh, we also have our server components, which are uh, primarily written in C++. So all the business logic is shared among these endpoints. And so the business logic for the web is in C++ and is part of the same repo. We have five different architectures that we support, 32 and 64-bit ARM, uh, Intel 64-bit and 32-bit, and Chippy, which is a ARM, a 32-bit ARM x86 hybrid. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, it's very similar to the ARM 64 EC emulation compatible that we released, um, both Office and Windows and the Visual Studio team all have blogs on ARM64 EC, so there's a lot of information out there if you want to uh, find out more about it. Um, and then, like I said, all of the production binaries are built by Microsoft uh, Visual C++, and for Clang, we run just the front end ag against uh, a majority of the code. On Apple, we have two different endpoints. We have iOS and macOS. They're similar, but if you've ever had to program against both, you know they're not exactly the same. They have some, some differences among them. Um, we support native Apple Silicon now, in addition to the Intel Silicon that we've had support for for a long time. And then the compiler that we use is Clang, uh, delivered to us by Apple via Xcode. On Android, there's no difference in endpoints. If you're on an Android device, whether it's a, a tablet or a phone, it's still just Android to us. Uh, four architectures, 32 and 64-bit ARM, 32 and 64-bit Intel. And the compiler we use is Clang. It's delivered to us by Google in the NDK, the native development kit. So, huge size. And I'd like to open this with a question. By a show of hands, who thinks it's valuable to have a huge code base? Uh, I got like two, three? Okay, not very many of you. I, I'm not leading you on. I'm actually interested in, in what everybody thinks here. We'll come back to it. So by traditional measures, I hope you agree that Office is a huge code base. We have nearly 350 million lines of code, about 100 million lines of native code. Uh, during peak check-in volumes, it's about two check-ins a minute. There's approximately 4,000 engineers in office. Uh, I, I will call out that that's not 4,000 native developers, that's 4,000 for office as a whole for the, for the model repo. And a full set of Office releases is about 50 terabytes. So let's focus on why it's so hard to count lines of code, in spite of that being the most common way that we talk about the size of a code base. I bet you can guess who I'm going to talk about. It's our old friend, the preprocessor. So here's a simple example. How many lines are there in this example? <laughs> it's more than one. I would say it's more than one. If you come up with a good argument for one, tell me afterwards. Um, so what do you count? Do you actually count the preprocessor lines themselves? Maybe. How many different implementations do you see in this? That's one we'll come back to in a little bit. 
So you really can't answer how many lines are in here unless you understand what the code is before this snippet and what all the command line flags are too. It's hard to reason about. So I tried to come up with something that would be easy to make guesses about in isolation. You might guess what server is, what client is. What if it's not something as straightforward as this? What if the uh, condition is MSO util stat? What does that mean? What if it winds up being more nested than this simple example? So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that we don't have, in the code base that I work on, we don't have client and server versions. We wouldn't have code like this. So here's a different one. I bet many of you have if def debugs. It wasn't hard for me to find an office. I did a simple search just using our uh, internal code tool. 20,000 hits for if def debug in the office repo. And you can find simple things like this, I'm sure, in your own code, where you have you know, a simple performance counter that you want to test how something works out. But what about that second one? Like, how much is that going to be modifying your code? This could be bringing in a whole extra subsystem worth of functionality for the sake of debugging. So what's an alternative measure? I think the ideal measure for C++ code would be to count the number of unique translation units provided to a compiler. And that's kind of hard to come up with in, in isolation. So I don't want to say that we should come up with the full combinatorial explosion of what every single if def in your code could actually be, but focus on what's actually in use. Something that's run by a customer, something that's run by a developer in the course of their own testing, what's run by your automation system when it runs tests. So a pretty good proxy for that is counting, I'm sorry, is counting the number of compilations that you have to build your software and all of the individual uh, slices that are actually in use. In Office, we think about these configurations on three different axes. So the platform, the architecture, and then we build both debug and ship versions. So, Here's what it looks like for Office. To build all of Office in all of these configurations, it's two million compiler invocations. I'll claim that two million is a huge number. So the way that this breaks down, to give you a little bit uh, to help kind of compartmentalize some of the things that are inside of here, about 60% of all of the compilations are for Windows in blue there. And then it's about 22% for Apple, 18 for Android. A couple other things to note is that for Android, because we don't have those endpoint differences, all of those boxes are about the same size. If you take the largest and small of, smallest of the Android boxes and figure out what the difference is, it's only about a 2% difference uh, among those boxes. One additional thing to note is the kind of bottom middle in the blue where we have the Clang debug, that's about 10% of the total Windows compilations, or 5% overall for um, Office All Up. And on the Apple side, Mac OS is about 20% bigger than iOS. So what does all of this size cost us? The most obvious is the total workload to build the product. So you can pay with time, because it takes a lot of time to do all of the building and linking. You can pay with hardware and just continue to throw more boxes at it. You can get a very clever build system that does uh, speed ups for you with caching and with parallelization. Um, I had a professor actually in college who said that's the only two tricks that CS has for anything are either caching and parallelization. Um, but you can't really escape the fact that it's a ton of work. And don't forget, I said to build all of Office, it's 50 terabytes. If you have a release archive, that's a lot of storage that adds up. 
The other thing is that the chart that I showed you was only for production compilation. We already talked about this in the keynote, is that static analysis is the way to ensure that you have high quality software. So all of those compilations that I was talking about for production, you just doubled them. On Clang, we use the uh, uh, analysis flag, we use analyze on MSVC, and all of those get run separately. They don't get run for every single time that you uh, build any version of the product, like if you're just building something to send for test, but for every full release of Office, we do a separate pass of static analysis. What's the scope of migrations? So even the smallest platform, the Android platform, if you want to migrate to a new compiler, you have to have 350,000 compilations succeed. And then once you're done with that, you have to make sure that all of the changes that you made don't regress the other platforms because some of that code is shared. If you don't have a team and processes in place, you wind up having a lot of inertia to be able to do those types of migrations, whether it's a new compiler, moving to a new language version. It was a really big effort when Office moved to C++ 17, and we expect it's gonna be at least as much, if not more, to go to C++ 20. Next, if you have a huge amount of code, I sure hope you have a huge number of tests for it too. Think about the age of Office. 1983 was well before unit testing became established as a best practice in the industry. So we have a really good history of doing kind of end-to-end -end tests, scenario tests, but trying to adapt uh, unit tests to all of the legacy-rich code that we have in Office hasn't been as successful. Though I will talk a little bit later about some techniques that we use to make that less onerous for new code moving forward. And then the last thing I wanna talk about as the cost of size, and one that I don't think gets talked about very often, is what is it going to cost to decommission the code? Does anybody remember the application InfoPath as part of Office? Wasn't very popular, but maybe, is that a hand? Hey, one person does. Um, or who remembers uh, you know, some of the old mobile operating systems that uh, Windows used to have, like Windows CE? I'm sorry to say, uh, more hands for that one. Uh, I'm sorry to say there are still references to those inside Office Code today because it wasn't done in a manner that made it easy to extract all of that code after it had reached the end of the life. Every so often you wind up getting a code review that references one or the other of those products or platforms because there really wasn't enough ROI to go and thoroughly scrub everything at the time that they were decommissioned. Um, this is another one where uh, the 2014 talks talk more about it because like I said, we have tried a couple different things to support Apple throughout the history of Office. So here's a expanded version of the history of Office here. And so each of these lines specifically is something that increased the size of Office. The one that stands out in isolation is the 2019 adding Clang analysis for Windows code. That one was almost purely an engineering decision. The thought was, you know, we have multiple platforms, I'd say, most of it, most of the developers work on Windows. We wound up seeing a lot of like cross-platform breaks because Clang and MSVC would accept different code. So the value proposition there is it's worth it to be able to analyze this code, run it, make it easy for developers to run on Windows and reduce the amount of breaks that we wind up subsequently seeing on Apple. All the rest of these though, are decisions that were made uh, jointly between the engineering leadership and the business leadership. At the end of the day, Office is a business. If you're going to expand the size, you better have some customers when you get there. 
Um, We've got really smart people on the Office team. I bet we could have made a version of Office that ran on OS 2. But if there weren't going to be customers, it was not actually worth the cost of doing that product. So let's come back to what I asked at the beginning. Is it valuable to have a huge code base? This is what Mike was talking about. You talk about trade-offs, the answer is of course, it depends. <laughs> so it depends on your organization's ability to bear those costs, to accurately estimate them. If you have the engineering infrastructure to be able to handle what you've taken on. So what is the target market for your software? If you've got a smaller target, that can be good. You have lower costs. It can be an advantage to be small. A larger target means you've got more overhead and your company needs to be able to bear that expense. This is the essence of software engineering, the ability to make the correct decisions for your software over time. So after the conference, as you make it back to work and you have discussions with your colleagues, with engineering leaders, try to keep the costs and the benefits of size in mind. So next I wanna talk about small components and liblets in Office. So liblets are one of the ways that we have to help mitigate all of the huge size in Office. It's the architectural backbone of our shared code. So from the history, I mentioned in 1995, they created a shared library for common functionality. It had a few, uh, I mean, it really was just a few pieces of shared functionality, common dialogues, uh, common help system, back when help actually shipped in the box and wasn't just sending people to a bunch of web pages that are published um, out of band common asserting framework. Um, they named it MSO, which was creatively Microsoft Office. Um, but this idea really took off. So if to continue the shipping analogy, we've added a new boat to the fleet and we started putting a couple things in it. It took off and after 15 years, this is what MSO looked like. I was told you shouldn't put slides that people can't read on there, but I'm not really sure how this is readable even if you were right up front and staring at it. Look at the density of links in this diagram. I don't see an internal structure, it's a giant spaghetti blob. <laughs> if you were a developer who had, had to add a new component to MSO at this time, what might it depend on? By the time you've completed the work, it might depend on everything else in there. <laughs> there really wasn't a distinction between having a public API or a private API. I mean, you can always do some sort of tricks to just put the right include in, you wind up accessing a member of another class, and there wasn't a way to uh, do any hiding other than tricks like putting a namespace that says do not use or private and without enforcement, I think you can guess how well that wound up working. There wasn't any way to formally enforce what was meant to be an, uh, public or private for anything. So I'm deliberately showing this diagram for how things uh, were back then because and, and the date is important, 2010, because if you remember the history, that's when we wind up adding support for the web and for mobile. This lack of structure was really hurting our ability to iterate quickly as we were developing the new platforms. So, and again, <laughs> to continue the shipping analogy, this is where we are with MSO.
So Liblets came to the rescue. Uh, the Liblet initiative was launched uh, in 2010. The name Liblets was uh, something that had been come up with because we wanted something that was easy to remember, you know, maybe a little bit fun. A couple of the other things I remember being on um, there were like piezos or quarks or components, which I kind of used generically throughout this presentation to talk about things pre-Liblet. Um, it's really too bad that the developer who uh, came up with the name Liblet didn't get a, uh, some kind of royalty for it. I'm pretty sure she would be retired on a tropical island at this point if she had. Um, but the name stuck. And there were really two things that the Liblet Initiative was trying to tackle. First was to develop a philosophy for how discrete units of code built into static libraries should be structured and interact with each other. The second and more direct one was break up the monolith. So here's the picture once again for the monolith. And here's how the first set of clean dependencies uh, that were extracted from the monolith got organized. So this isn't everything. This is just kind of the, the, after the first big push. So take a, take a look at some of, the similar, some of the same things that I talked about with the blob. What's the density of links look like here? Significantly lower. Also, there's actually a sense of structure. That very, very bottom one right there is ship asserts because that's something that winds up being used by almost every other component in Office Shared Code, well, and beyond for that matter. But it fans out into kind of a thicker middle layer, and then you've got a couple of high-level liblets up at the top. So this may not be as large as the ship that I shared earlier in the huge size, but it's a good start on the journey for trying to tackle the complexity of our shared code. So that prior diagram and the fact that it has a sense of structure uh, is a good introduction to the layered nature of how we actually compose liblets. So instead of one monolithic shared library, now we've got a layered series of shared libraries. Critically, these lower layer libraries can't call into code at a higher layer. The reverse is true though, a higher layer calls into the lower ones. And every time that a new liblet gets added, we try to add it as high as possible. The idea is that each layer is as thin as it needs to be in order to kind of meet the targets for what it's supposed to do. So this is another case of engineering for business value. The idea is if you have an application that can get away loading less code, shipping less code, do it. <laughs> and I'll talk about what some of those are. So the lowest layer is MSO20. This is very low level functionality, diagnostics, experimentation, telemetry. This allows for low level process, like you have a background process or UI less service that lets you use the um, telemetry system, but you don't have to do anything. Um, you don't have to load the full, full monolith. Um, office app applications are primarily uh, document based. So the next layer is, that we've uh, arbitrarily called 30 is focused on document synchronization. You have uh, the authentication code, file I.O. code, identity code. So if you need something that's just going to do kind of uh, document movement or do some uh, sign in to server components, you can get away with just using 30. Uh, 40 is where you start seeing a big difference among the platforms. This is where we have uh, the UI frameworks and where we wind up having graphics code. Uh, the 2014 talks have a really detailed section about how we have, uh, what the overall architecture is for graphics and how they have something that's easy to work on across all of our different platforms. So yeah, definitely go check out all the extra information in the 2014 talks if you wanna know more about graphics. Uh, and then uh, next up from that is MSO 98. This is kind of roughly clean liblets. 
This was done around 2014 that we created a brand new layer of separation uh, specifically for the Skype for Business product. And so we wound up having more things extracted from the monolith, put into these clean liblets so that you'd have a much smaller package size to do uh, Skype for Business. And then MSO still lives. So at a certain point, the ROI got much smaller for actually extracting individual components. I'll talk a little bit later about uh, some of the things that we did to partially liberalize MSO, but MSO as a project still exists, MSO as a DLL still exists, and you know, ships in the box or on your phone or on the web. So what are the philosophy, what, ph what was the philosophy of liblets that was developed? There are five pillars. Liblets use modern C++. Liblets have a distinct public API. They are self-contained. They have clean dependencies. And they are unit tested. So the first one of these is that Liblets use modern C++. As I mentioned, this effort was kicked off in 2011. Maybe some of you remember some other C++ things going on in 2011. Um, <laughs> the release of C++11, and then, of course, all of the pre-work when it was still OX, uh, you know, we heard quite a bit about that at Microsoft. And that energy that was being injected into the overall C++ ecosystem was really great, and we built on that in order to do liblets. It was a chance to revitalize the language, a chance to revitalize our shared code as well. And historically, too much of the code in Office, well, originally because C was just what it was written in, but even after the fact, it was still written as C that just happened to run through a C++ compiler. So we wanted to make the distinction as people were writing liblets or we were extracting and kind of refreshing components that were in the monolith, that we were really going to write C++ code. And part of that meant that it had to be exception safe. And now that we can use exceptions, we can use the standard library. Those components I mentioned earlier from PowerPoint had served us well for a long time, but it was a real burden to anybody coming into office from the outside, having to relearn all of the things and being told you can't use the standard library because we weren't set up for success with it yet. Um, so I wish for this slide I could say that this applied to not only anything that was written new and everything that it was existing in the monolith, but really this code focus, this pillar of it focuses on new components that were added afterwards, kind of new code after kind of the liblet philosophy had permeated office. Next, liblets must have a distinct public API. Headers must be explicitly marked for public consumption. And this is enforced by our build system. Like I mentioned earlier, if when you're in the monolith, anything's fair game, as long as you're in the same project, you can include a header. And you can reach in and potentially touch things that the original designers hadn't um, intended for external consumption. Um, each header also must be self-contained. So I mentioned we have tools that are built on uh, Clang's lib tooling, and all of the headers then are processed in isolation. So it, you know, every header has to include really what it uses. There can't be a secret uh, list of includes that you have to put in before you include any one of these public APIs. It has to all be written right in there. Um, and then, every public API must be marked as such. So in this process class, there uh, example that I have up here, we've got three, three methods. The way that you should read those in those liblet public API annotations is the first, get app path, is available on all platforms. The second one, get payload folder, available only on Apple. And then get res folder, get resource folder, is available only for Windows platforms. 
So let's take a brief digression to talk about symbol visibility and why this is so important to marking your APIs as public. So if you've ever written a Windows DLL, you remember these macros? Yeah, that kind of a pain in the neck. Um, traditionally in Office, we don't like them because it's a statement to say, you will export this data, this, this method. And it's not under the choice of the consumer. And we'll talk a little bit about how we flip the script on that. If you're dealing with uh, Apple or Android, you've seen these macros before, I'm sure. So historically, because we didn't allow either of these, we'd have big files, def files, full of mangled names. And these would have to be hand edited. So this is real office code from one that hasn't been converted yet. And uh, honestly, this isn't the whole file. This is one section. Names are mangled per platform and per architecture. This is like uh, a fifth of the file? So what do you do if you want to add a new parameter in there? There's probably one person in all of Office who actually remembers some of the tricks for how actual things mangle and would need to be edited in here. More often you wind up just making the change, compiling it, watching it break, looking up from the break what the new name should be, and then go patching it in, and then repeat for all the other times that it's in the file. It's a pain in the neck, and the tool generates that for you. Uh, it's powered by these macros right here. These are, uh, it, there's a couple more permutations that I didn't put on the slide just for length, but this is really what's in there. On Apple, we're using the visibility directly. We're gonna give that a try. Um, where everything in the, in the shared library is marked uh, private by default and only things marked with the attribute show up in the DLL. Uh, for the and that helps a lot with uh, sizes of the binaries and other optimizations. For Windows and for uh, Android, we have these annotations. These persist into the AST, excuse me, so that the uh, application that's built on lib tooling can pick them up. It knows what platform you're building for, what your architecture is, it knows how to mangle the name, and just emits it into a file for you. No more hand editing. Next, liblets are self-contained. Liblets may have multiple implementations. Implementations are different than endpoints, though. Uh, that's what the, I guess, <laughs> the third bullet is, is that architectures are orthogonal. Because implementations are organized around functionality. You could have an empty implementation, a mock implementation, a stub implementation. You could have one for mobile, for server. Um, ideally, you wind up finding something, and I'll have a, a better example later on, that's not just endpoint related, or, or kind of roughly endpoint related in the way that like mobile and server are. Um, there should be some kind of uh, sense of or subsystem that underlies what the differences wind up being. Um, it's important to note that if you build one of these implementations, it does not necessarily mean that you have to build the other. So, in a, for example, if you build a server one, that doesn't mean that there necessarily has to be a client version or a mobile version. We're trying to practice, you aren't gonna need it. Um, so here's an example, the same one that we saw earlier when I was uh, railing against the preprocessor. I asked earlier how many implementations are present. Your gut might be two, but there's really three. What if neither server nor client is defined? There's an empty implementation hiding in here too. So this is more what we'd like to see in liblets. Three individual files, one for each. And if you notice, as I renamed them for the sake of this slide, it's not mobile and server as they got changed. It's talking about the subsystems that are being in use. One of them is working very at a very low level by actually getting a device context and a graphics object and doing the actual rendering. The other one is handing off to another uh, another helper function 
that winds up doing the HTML rendering. And then the empty impl, because it's just empty. That's, that's a pretty uh, straightforward name in, in and of itself. So this does not mean that you should also duplicate things that are shared among each of these implementations. That's just the kind of physical code layout that you have to worry about. You can have one file that has all the things that are common, and then you read these individual files as, what is unique for this implementation? Next, liblets have clean dependencies. So the power in this is that any consumer who wants to take a dependency on a liblet codes against a specific endpoint or implementation. They code against the public API. And these decisions about exactly which endpoint or implementation are used are dictated by the consumer. So in this example, we're gonna talk about a liblet called image renderer. We've got three different implementations that it provides. It has a client, a server, and a store implementation. And so this is what it might look like in kind of the internal XML format that we use to define liblets. Um, it declares that it has a dependency on artconfig, and then it has the three endpoints that I mentioned. So let's look at artconfig. Artconfig is very generic. It knows how to do configuration for every Windows implementation. So what does that look like in there? Pretty much what you'd expect. It declares that it has a dependency on the registry. You can kind of see that, that you'd be storing preferences on the configuration that a user might set. And that it defines just a single endpoint for Windows. And then what does registry look like? More similar to image render. It has three endpoints, client, server, and store. And this one's pretty low level. There's not a, uh, any extra dependencies in registry. So I haven't talked about multiple, endpoint, uh, multiple implementations, though. So let's add one. Let's say that there's an empty impl for the registry, and you can see that you might want to have something like that for um, the sake of testing, where you don't actually have to make registry calls. So we'll just define that. And that one isn't flavored at all. That could be used on any one of our endpoints. So how do you put them together? This is a extremely simplified version of what this would look like then. So, if you think back to the layered diagram and how we have the shared libraries, this image renderer will live in MSO40 alongside many of the other pieces of the UI and graphics frameworks. So in the link targets, the static libraries it's going to link are artconfig and image renderer, and quite a few more than that. Uh, there's dozens to hundreds of individual liblets inside each one of those layers. But then it also depends on that lower layer, on 30, because that's where the registry lives. And so it actually, I think technically it lives in 20, but it layers all the way down. You depend on 30, 30 depends on 20. And then the same thing for like the server. Once again, you have the same uh, declarations of what your link targets are, and it knows that it has each of those. But if you wanted to build a test DLL for the image renderer, in this case, now you can make a different selection. And because you don't want to load up all of those individual layers, you'll pick only the liblets that you require to build that DLL. So image rendered is in there because that's what you're testing. Art config is in there because that was a direct dependency. And then down the line, you can now link in the empty impl or the empty impl for registry. So let's talk about dependency validation and how that leads to clean dependencies. So the final arbiter at the end of the day is of course going to be the linker. It loves to tell you if you've actually forgotten a symbol that something else was calling. But we wanted stricter validation than just what the linker would provide. So once again, we built a tool 
This time it's actually not built on uh, libtooling. It actually just goes in with uh, libcoff and rips apart the object files on Windows and I forget what the supporting library is, but a similar thing on Android. Um, and it uses only the def files to do validation, not the linker. So this is proof that only the public APIs are in use. Um, you know, you, you know that there's ways to fool the linker if you really have to. Make a little sub-library here, you know, include this other header there. Okay, you can get to something and actually satisfy the linker. So this is a much stricter check than what you'd wind up getting from a linker. Um, this also makes sure to that we have uh, prevention of cycles among liblets. Because that was, or if you remember, I mentioned that for MSO, where because it all was one uh, binary at the end of the day, it didn't really need to have an internal structure, cycles are fine. We don't want that for ex, uh, individually, liblets that are specified as individual projects. And then the last piece of philosophy is that liblets are unit tested. So it's very easy to think because of the complexity of Office and how many um, dependencies there are on you know, operating system components and other parts of the system, uh, you don't want to load up the entire monolith. You want to have unit tests. And so what we can do is automatically generate mocks from clean APIs. So this is an extra, an, this is real office code, but uh, fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, I shortened it a little bit with some autos and things like that just to make sure that it fit on the slide, but like I said, real office code. We'll create one of these uh, mock documents. We'll set its is open to return false. We'll create a new one, another mock object, this I application document descriptor. We'll wire that up to the other mock doc that was there call some simple tests. Very straightforward. But you can do more interesting things with this as well. So in this case, it's going to create a lambda for this set dirty, and what it's doing is making sure that this mock I document, or the I document that is held by this persister base object actually correctly forwards calls down from that parent object into its child. And so you can see there, we're going to count the number of calls, we're gonna validate that it's set dirty, wire it up to use this lambda, do some simple tests. So what does that look like under the covers? What does that auto-generated series of mocks look like? So the mock I document object in Office is much, much bigger. So I've isolated just the pieces that I demonstrated in those, these prior two examples. So you can see it's all powered by lambdas. You've got simple overrides that are already there to do things like return, to override return values, or like in the prior example, you can wire up your own custom lambda to do whatever it is that you'd like to test. So let's talk about how much of a success the Liblet project was. And I talk about it like it's uh, already over with, but in many ways it's not. Part of it is that it's a philosophy, and so this is ongoing and something that we use in Office shared code and beyond, as I'll talk about in one second here. So throughout Office, 73% of the Office projects define one or more Liblets. Um, if you extrapolate further, nearly every project in Office consumes at least one liblet because of the way that we share code. So even MSO has been libletized. Um, we've relaxed some of the dependency enforcement, and again, we didn't modernize all of the uh, C++ that was pre-existing in, in MSO. Um, there's quite a few liblets still in MSO, that's the, that's the orange section, versus uh, isolated standalone uh, liblets that either have been extracted from MSO or have been new code that has been added uh, since then. 
And so most of what I've been talking about is how liblets are uh, part of our shared code. But liblets have also um, the, uh, the philosophy of how we actually have clean dependencies, modern code, unit tests, have started to uh, influence the way that individual client applications, the endpoints, the words, the Excels, the PowerPoints that you know of uh, as external customers, that philosophy has uh, pervaded those teams and then their internal structure follows many of the Liblet principles. Of course, Office shared code doesn't rest. So I'd like to close by sharing some current work that we're doing in Office. Um, I'd like to preface this section by saying that the work is very much in active development. And so everything I'm going to talk about on stage today is only the state of Office as of September 2022. I'm excited to announce that we are working on migrating to header units. So what are header units, if you haven't heard of them before? Header units are a step between the header files and C++ 20 modules. They provide some of the benefits that modules give you. The compiler can process them faster than header files, but they don't have all of the advantage of modules because they still expose macros, and there's not a way to do private visibility inside of header units in the same way that you can with modules. Header units are more flexible than a precompiled header. With a precompiled header, you can't choose to bring in just one of the headers in the precompiled header. The compiler is going to process all of them. With header units, even if you compile them together into a static library, you'll only bring in the contents of the header unit that you import into your application. So in Office, we're very concerned about build speed. Remember, workload size was the number one thing that I said about uh, the cost of having a huge code base. So it's almost become like a rite of passage. A brave office developer will undertake a project to craft the perfect pre-compiled header. They'll spend weeks deciding for every individual header, should it be included, should it not be included? And they'll declare success but as we add new code, as refactoring winds up happening, those gains start to evaporate and are lost. So let's try to make header units and slay the fact that you have to come up with this perfect ideal of a pre-compiled header once and for all. Liblets and header units were a match made for each other. So what are the pre uh, prerequisites to create header units? Header units, or the headers that go into header units should be self-contained. That sounds kind of familiar. That was, uh, that was one of the uh, liblet philosophies. So we got that one. Liblets have acyclic dependencies. Hey, we got that one with liblets too. And that you can't have inconsistent uh, conditional compilation. Uh, we're, working, we're working on that one. So we don't have the, the client-server split that I used a couple times as an example, but we still have things like this. So we have this uh, assume macro that we've come up with. If you're in a component that's actually des defined asserts, we'd like to pop one up for you. If we don't, no, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just let it go. Um, we have to make a choice. There's really no way around this. So when this is part of a header that's being compiled as a header unit, you have to pick one. You know, the compiler will helpfully give you a message that says that this is inconsistent between when it was built and when it was consumed. So that's uh, a problem that we're continuing to work on. And it's not just individual code like this, too. It also is some compiler flags or other um, conditional uh, compilation flags that are set. So you have to decide, are you compiling with Unicode support? Or are you not compiling with Unicode support? Should a character be signed or unsigned? All of these flags need to be consistent or you can't consume the header unit. Uh, the other big one that we ran into is, are you using the static 
or dynamic C runtime library. So you can make flavors for these, but for the initial work that we're doing, we're just trying to figure out what the most common one is and stick with that. We'll do some measurement to figure out if they should be different in the future. So what progress have we made to date? We created 90 header units. We've actually created much more, but there's, uh, there's still challenges between being able to compile a header as a header unit and then being able to sex, uh, successfully consume it at any point afterwards. This is, like I said, very, very much ongoing development. Uh, I was able to successfully build all three of the low-level MSO20 DLLs for uh, client, server, and store. And then 40% of the generated header units were consumed during the build. The way that we've got this set up is that each individual liblet will decide that it's ready to produce header units. And so every public, uh, every public header that's inside that uh, liblet then becomes or creates a header unit. And they'll get used somewhere in Office, but there's no guarantee that it was consumed on the path to make MSO, the MSO20 DLLs. Um, of course, I'm sure that people are very excited about what the performance, the build, what this will do to build throughput. Uh, we very much want to uh, quantify that as well, so unfortunately I don't have any of that to share today. And then like I talked about, we're gonna have to do a lot of measurement. Again, that was uh, something I was glad to hear Bjarne say this morning, measure, measure, measure. We'll have to do measurement on how much effort is it to create each individual flavor of header units, whether it's for you know, Unicode or uh, dynamic or static CRT um, versus just having the small number of consumers continue to use textual includes versus header units. Uh, there's a blog post that uh, if my co-author uh, push the button will be up at that AKA MS redirect. Uh, you can also just go directly to the Microsoft Visual C++ uh, blog site should be the first one that's up there right now. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to, to publicly thank the Visual C++ team for being absolutely amazing partners for all of this work. So I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse behind the seeds of Office, its scope and its architecture. Hopefully you've discovered some new ways to think about your own code as well. Thank you. So once again, plug for the uh, Visual C++ Discord channel and the survey. I encourage you to enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, here's some other talks from Microsoft that are gonna be going on this week. Um, hopefully you find something up there that you are interested in watching as well. And then uh, here's a couple of the links that I talked about for the original two office presentations from CPP uh, CPPCon 2014, uh, documentation on how to do header units in your own build. Uh, those are really good documents. Uh, that's what I started from. There's more information about exactly what office was doing um, in the blog post as well. And I'll take questions. Looks like we have uh, just a few minutes for questions. We have, we have uh... Some questions from online. Perfect. Um, have you found that code in liblets has less churn than code that hasn't been cleaned up? How often are there modifications to the lowest level of liblets? Uh, it depends quite a bit on what exactly the liblets are. There are literally hundreds of them. So something that could be under very active development, say uh, like inking, is something that we're, we're working on a lot. Those wind up having churn as we get new APIs in from the operating system and just wind up being there. Low level liblets, I suppose I could say maybe they have less churn because you know it's established what they are, but there's always a chance for a new language construct to uh, come up with a better way to do things or additional cleanup because we wind up not needing as much uh, variety in the API surface over time. So, Maybe it's, but it, it varies very much based on what any individual liblet and its responsibilities are. <laughs>
got another question. My okay. understanding is that liblets are static libraries that are then linked together with other liblets to create shared libraries like MSO 2.0, uh, MSO 3.0, DLL, et cetera, mm -hmm. which, which create a layer structure. Right. How does the picture of build artifacts differ when shipped versus when a developer is adding code? For example, shipped artifacts are DLLs, so a single developer compiling code, code results in a static library liberal, that is essentially relinked with MSO.DLLs. I'm afraid I don't understand that question. If the person asking that could just ping me on Discord with additional details. Um, at the end of the day, if you're either going to, I'll, I'll do my best with it, but if, if this doesn't answer your question, please ping me later. Um, at the end of the day, there's only one way to build the artifacts for Office. Um, maybe you don't have to build literally everything if you're working on an individual component and you're only going to do unit testing locally. Um, but at the end of the day, when you, when you ship Office, and we have you know, a whole automation system to do end-to-end uh, -end and scenario testing, that all needs to be built and there's not a difference between debug and ship, it has to all build and it has to all pass tests. Has any of the Liblet tooling infrastructure been open sourced? Is it available for use outside of Microsoft? No, it is not. And I'm a little bit curious to find out which portions people would be interested in. That's something that we could explore, though I think we'd want to see a lot of demand to make sure the ROI was there to share it with the entire uh, community. To a certain extent, the things that are inside of there are, I don't wanna undersell the work we've done, but they're fairly straightforward traversals of the AST. Like, traverse the AST, find, some, uh, find this attribute that's been put on there, call the name mangler. There you go. It's, 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 a lot of groundwork given to us by the framework and not a lot of very complicated things that we've done internally. I think the novelty of it is mostly in the way that uh, we kind of thought of a way to combine those pieces. Are all Liblet dependencies considered to be compile time, link time dependencies? Are there scenarios in the office code base where Liblet dependencies are established at runtime? No, that, that's all compile. Uh, that's all compile time dependencies, compile and link time dependencies. There's no dynamic loading for individual liblets. Yeah, I think um, we're at three. All right. Thanks very much.